And we just wanted to say that we are so happy to be here today. So thank you for coming to, to see our journey webinar series. Today, we have some awesome presenters sharing their experiences for part three, the journey into art therapy practice. And before we get started, we'd like to thank the American Art Therapy Association, the Multicultural Committee and Education Committee for its collaborations, as well as our presenters and co-hosts for being here for us today and putting this series together. The presenters' lived experiences distinctly amplify their educational, professional, and biopsychosocial ecological context together. And this is not intended to endorse any specific program or place or state or anything like that, um, or any kinds of art therapy experiences that may occur. It's just an, an invitation for you to understand and learn more and get to know each other better. And that said, we hope that this program will allow you to learn a lot from one another, ask questions, and take this time to reflect and celebrate your own art therapy journeys or professional journeys, wherever that may be. Um, before our presenters take the spotlight tonight, we welcome to you, you to use the chat function or ask questions, raise your hands, and such like that um, to, to, to discuss and respond to anything that happens in this presentation. We know that we might not be able to answer every single question that you have um, or celebrate every single comment that you make, but we do appreciate your presence here and we're excited to have you here. Uh, we will be having a Q&A directly at the end for the last 10 minutes or so, and we encourage you to make the most of this opportunity. So uh, one of our presenters may be coming in just a tad bit late. Um, we are working with him to make sure that the login goes through. Um, but thank you all so much again for your patience. I think there he is, Jonathan. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's welcome Claire and Jonathan. Yay! Hello. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try something, everyone, and you can let me know in the chat if it gets really wonky. I want to ensure there's nothing being covered, so I'm just going to minimize or make this window a little smaller. You can let me know if it disappears. Oh, it disappeared. Okay. I'll put it back. All right. Jonathan, are you there? I can't. Unfortunately, I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see anyone's lovely face he's here and jonathan you're still muted yes i am here hey okay awesome so um ash thank you for the introduction um folks just so you know i'm gonna uh jonathan if you don't mind like just monitoring if we get some chat questions throughout um just because I don't want to open it and then block things on the on the presentation, but so if happy to be here. It's a presenter view. Okay, well, since we're already at this point, I think it would be all right to just kind of uh, get started if you're okay with it. I've got the slides. If you got the chat, we got you. <laughs> Sounds Thank good. You. All right, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here and for having us. Um, my name is Claire Kalala and co-presenting with me today. Jonathan, you're gonna introduce yourself. I do, I want you to see me first. Oh. One moment. Good sure thing. My name is Jonathan Sword. And Claire and I have been working about this as working on this as we've been entering the field. We've both been in graduate school. I am currently working in a women's prison in Indiana. And I was hired as an art therapist. So we can get more introductions later and you'll see my smiling face, I promise, in just a minute or two. Awesome. Uh, so Jonathan shared a little bit about his work and kind of his entrance into the field. Um, so a little bit of background about me. I trained in undergraduate school um, as a painter, and I also had a first kind of brief career as a special educator. Um, so it's been really exciting for me to bridge kind of the two worlds of um, special education and working with uh, neurodiverse folks um, with art therapy. And I do that now uh, working in a non-public school. I went to GW um, here in Alexandria and uh, just graduated a year ago. So very much um, here to talk about the, 
the very immediate um, journey into practice uh, as of now. Um, I went to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia for my undergrad degree, very passionate about social justice, um, inclusivity, kind of in all the ways and representation, um, certainly as a way of working and being as an art therapist, but um, in other realms of life too. Um, and I'm really excited to share that I'm as I'm kind of working, um, getting my hours and um, moving towards full licensure, I am um, preparing to open my own art therapy practice um, in the near future. So it's a little bit about me. Now for me, I had to match Claire when she put a self-portrait. <laughs> I was motivated to do some self-examination and I also started working on a series of self-portraits because my identity after graduate school has been changing into the identity of me as an art therapist, right? So I have a wonderful uh, supervisor named Barb, Dr. Barbara Fish, and uh, she advised me to get grounded in what it's like to be who I am now reinterpreted and reinvented as an art therapist. So it's response art and processing art. I started doing a series of self-portraits just to try to establish who am I? Because as it says in the slide, I've been a professional artist for 40 years. And the idea of combining my deep personal beliefs, so the so sign says, so the slide says, with the healing qualities of psychotherapy in 2018. So I kind of represent a non-traditional art therapy student entering the field. I've been around the block a time or two and to be in a reinvention phase at this time in my life is challenging and very rewarding. So I just got my degree at the end of 2021 and I had an earlier graduate degree from Columbia, but that's light years ago. So I am passionate about nonverbal communication. And I have found in my limited time in the field that there are many people who just don't have the vocabulary to talk about some feelings. And I find that particularly common in men, actually. I find very few men in our field and I find uh, art therapy to be very effective when treating men. And currently I'm building an art therapy program in that women's correctional facility that I mentioned. So Claire, it's your turn. We're on the clock. All right, awesome. So we wanted to um, share a little bit of artwork um, to kind of help um, speak a little bit about our experience and kind of journey into, into practicing as um, new or like as many of my professors would call us baby art therapists. Um, don't know if anyone's here, but. In my dreams. Yeah, and I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> um, or like maybe we're like toddler art therapists now, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I'd like to share a few uh, pieces that kind of speak a little bit about my experience with I think art making in general. So like I said, I was, you know, trained as a painter. That's what I did for my undergraduate degree. Um, and I spent a lot of time looking at people and thinking about relationships and spaces that I grew up in. Um, these are a couple of portraits um, that to me talk a lot about kind of where I come from. Um, and so <clears throat> I think that I always connected with making art um, in particular, as I kind of grew into my own art practice, making big oil portraits that required me to sort of get really physically involved and present and um, engaged and had me stay staring at an image or at a couple images and staring at colors at my paint palette. Um, for me, that was therapy. That was extremely, it was like the only time that my very, very busy brain was able to sort of still, um, despite having a lot of tasks kind of happening at once, it was all for one purpose. And so um, I paint very large and that was, um, that was a space for me to uh, pause and, and kind of reconvene. So that's a couple of these here. And that grew um, a little bit as I started to not only think about where it came from, but where I was going. Um, and so 
like many of the individuals that I work with now and many of those who I studied with in school, art was also uh, definitely a way to an avenue for self-exploration, for understanding ourselves, our identity. These are three portraits um, that live as a triptych um, and I got to share when I was living in Hawaii um, prior to starting my art therapy um, program. And really it was a, a time of great transition. I know a lot of like understanding of self um, moving kind of out of undergraduate um, experiences into first career in special education and really wanting to um, maintain those connections and those, um, yeah, kind of the, my artist identity and um, looking at those around me and, and sort of the strong, powerful figures that were in my life and um, upholding that part of me too. That's what these are. Also, as many of us um, do, and as many clients we might work with do, um, using art making and, and painting for me as a way to process grief and loss. Um, so I was always really curious about, uh, like I said, ideas about identity and um, wondering, you know, where I'm coming from, where I'm going. Um, and a lot of that life experience includes um, kind of painful moments that make you pause. And, um, and so when there were not words, much like Jonathan was sharing earlier, um, went to the paint palette and went to canvas. So here's a couple of pieces. One of them is from um, an experience of having to, the image on the right with the like four images kind of together with a white uh, border um, was a series of paintings done when I was tasked with having to um, photograph at my grandfather's funeral. And so kind of, you know, being the person like I'm sure many folks who are, um, artists or have some kind of artist identity are often put in those roles of having to do um, kind of a like capturing of a moment when you should also be involved in kind of the emotional process of grieving but um, that separation from the lens sort of what kind of respect is the, those offered me um, and very similarly as I started to move into more um, artist activism um, and thinking about like uh, painting and, and art process as a way to explore uh, racial justice issues um, and, and sort of like what that meant for folks who were being uh, erased or uh, experiencing loss in, in that way as well. And so that's what the image you see on the left. Really interested in a lot of materiality. Uh, that was actually a, it's a painting of a photograph um, of me playing around with like painting, with putting paint globs onto Polaroids that I found. Um, so a lot of experimental processes, a lot of using collage and mixed media to then kind of repurpose and create these bigger paintings um, or kind of capture these moments in time. And here's a few pieces or images about myself as a, an artist activist. Um, and so this is, I think, a big part of my identity as an art therapist, uh, which is really important as you're entering the practice, sort of sort of think about who you are um, as a person, first and foremost, who you are as an artist, and also that identity as an art therapist. And so I think a lot of my artwork shifted as uh, many, many of ours probably did um, over the pandemic, over what has been kind of a forever um, history of um, racial violence and social unrest um, in this country and abroad. Um, but certainly in the very present times um, in 2020, um, we all kind of uh, were living uh, through that experience. And um, I think many of my classmates used art making in, in over that summer, particularly, I would say, um, to kind of process like being in the pandemic, being in school during the pandemic, having all of these um, really profound and, and really horrible um, kind of social events happen. Um, and so like, yeah, these are a few of those pieces there. Um, the bottom image is really cool. It's from something called Chalky Pie. Uh, it was just been really nice for the couple of occasions pre-COVID, um, being able to get out and actually use art making uh, to really build community and work with folks who wanted to find ways to express themselves and to be able to share their sentiments um, about what it feels like to be silenced, to be um, erased, to have had you know violence perpetrated against them and people who look like them. So. I've always found room for art um, in these kind of circles and, and want to continue to do so in, in my practice as an art therapist. I've got a couple of videos. I think I'm going to just share one. Um, so 
during uh, the very like end, I would say last semester or so of school, um, was still doing school virtually and was really using um, or needing to find smaller ways. Like I said, I, I like to paint really big oil portraits or oil paintings. And so being having moved to a smaller apartment, it being um, quarantine and needing to like still make process art, still make art for myself in the throes of school and projects, looking to find like some smaller ways to do that. And I discovered zines as like a really, really adaptive and incredible tool to use to, that still gave me that same like kind of laser focus and materiality that I was looking for, the sensory experience. Um, and I really felt like I could express myself well with them. So put together a couple of fun clips um, for myself to kind of document and also to share with others. Um, again, in this kind of digital space. So I'll just share this video. It's like, I think a minute long. Give myself a little sound here. So another video kind of similar um, oops, to that first art journaling was another way. Um, I think that I was able to kind of engage in a smaller um, physical space, but to really have that same um, kind of connectivity. And so um, like so many of us, there was just so many changes and, um, you know, issues of, of loss and loneliness and um, alienation and, and, um, discomfort and all the things um, involved in the last few years. And so this was really a way to, to kind of process that experience and, and was also a way for me to offer um, to others who were experiencing it, whether it be like clients in my internship at the time or um, peers who are struggling to, um, to kind of work together and virtually spend some time um, making art together. I'm gonna skip this video. Those are available elsewhere. So I'm happy to share them at another time. No, um, and I, I think that- May I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Uh, Gina Woodruff would like to know what size the first zine was. Oh yeah, let's talk about zines. So zines are um, can be various sizes. Mine usually are on like an eight and a half by eleven um, piece of paper that's folded down to create. It's it's basically in eight sections. Um, happy to share a link about how to fold zines if you don't know. Um, but I've I've received zines that even like half page, so like a piece of printer paper folded in half with like inserts inside of it. Um, so usually eight and a half by 11 or nine by 12 um, folded down mm -hmm. to like a small, oh, fits in your pocket size. <laughs> awesome question. Anything else, Jonathan? Uh, not that I see. Awesome. So I think this is my last slide, but really briefly, I think um, kind of thinking about the journey into practice for me, a lot of it was combining these multiple identities of my own and meeting at the intersection. So again, like an oil painter interested in identity and self-image and um, social justice who then needed to find like smaller ways of working and found collage uh, to be really powerful and, and really helped me to kind of maintain that those voices that, I, that needed to be present and need to continue to be present um, in my work as an art therapist. So this is another triptych that combines some of those pieces together. Um, yeah, feel free to percolate on some questions or share them now in the chat if you want. I know we'll have some time later, but I want to keep moving so we've got room for it. All right, take it away, Jonathan. Let me know. You can just say like next and I'll click. I will. I'll, 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 I'll think of you as my audio visual specialist today. Perfect. You're a tough act to follow. But as we said, I'm Jonathan Sword, and it's been great to work with Claire on this presentation. As I said earlier, we can skip this slide. 
And this is, yeah, you'll find it in my slides, they're layered, okay? So it takes some time. In terms of processing art, during the process of going through my education, I had to rethink the identity of an artist because I was used to finding my own inspiration and then executing. During, uh, during the process of education, I had to stop being experienced, started being open to different ways of thinking, right? So I started making art on demand, which was really hard for me. It was art by assignment. And it gave me a, a pretty fine taste of my own, my own arrogance, maybe. And it, it got me off that perch of being an artist. And it's like, okay, this is art for other reasons. This is art for the sake of communication and getting it feeling. So it was a rough entry, but I made it. And on the left is one of those where I started tracing my hands, right? That was in one of my interventions that I like to use. I get the client to trace a distorted hand and then make a face out of it. And this was the beginning of that process. The one on the right is more um, processing the end of graduate school, getting back to my own roots as an artist and coming up with media that's uh, my own and processes some, some inner feelings toward the process of ending my degree. We could have the next slide. Yeah. Um, no, we'll have to back up on one on that. Yeah. On the left is what's underneath the painting on the right. I start with very fluid acrylic and then I use, you know what grease pencils are? And I only use four colors. And all the colors you see other than the blue of the acrylic paint is an invention of pure colors and layering them on top of each other. Next slide. These were about processing my internship in an inpatient unit on the left, and then a piece of work that I did while modeling behavior for one of the groups in the inpatient unit. And I found uh, my style worked well in communicating to them. And by, uh, this is just an interesting thing I found, by being a guy um, making art and modeling the behavior, it gave entry to other men who were in the inpatient unit that normally would sit away, right? Not participate. So I think it gave permission in a way. And maybe it's that grandpa thing that I have going on. I don't know. But they felt safe making art. If you have the next slide, please. This piece was about processing a conflict in the classroom I had with another student. And this was when I realized that I had merged identities as an artist and an art therapist. I was processing the conflict, but I was also processing uh, a way of working with it that speaks to my own sensibilities. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. We'll dance. So the question for us is now that we've graduated, what's next? What will I consider now? Where will I be in one to three years, five years, if I'm still alive? And what is my experience process in graduate school? Have my passions changed? What role did my gender play in my education? And what role will it pay, play in my employment? So that's, I don't know, Claire, if you've come up with some questions about yourself, but those were the big ones for me. And if we have the next slide. I think those are great questions. All right, go ahead. Do you want to address them now or wait till later? No, go for it. I just was commenting. Yeah, you can go for it. This is another intervention that I use and it's, it's not original. It's, uh, I've cited the sources on the slide and it's called spiral drawing. But it takes simple lines and the lines are created one by one and they form these wonderful patterns. And I use this with people who say they can't draw. And I've taught drawing 
too often to believe that, right? It's just you've never learned to not criticize and draw, which is a pretty therapeutic point of view, don't you think? So this is an example of one of the spiral drawings. The next slide. This, these, I tend to use, because the materials are so scant in some of the places where I work, this was done in a, a community mental health center. And I would use a dry erase board and I would do the same technique. If you notice on the left-hand side, there are six squares, basically. It's a matrix. I would fill in one of them, modeling the behavior, and then the client would do the one on the right. And what this did by putting all six of these together, it shows the, the sum is greater than, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. There starts to be interaction between the different squares. And we talk about, okay, what do you see? And what do I see? And then we compare, but we collaborate on an art piece basically. And, and in the collaboration, we're also collaborating on their therapeutic goals, right? And we start talking about how what they do may interface with what someone else does and make it more, which is important. I was working largely with substance use disorder. And then we worked on the circular one, which was a bit of a challenge. I'd love to be able to show you, but I don't have the video of it. Next slide, please. This is a similar, this I did with the inpatient unit on the left. Instead of, instead of having them draw or paint something, I had them make movements. And all of these dots are simply made one by one with a paintbrush. And the arcs are the arc, natural arcs of the wrist. So I would model the behavior and I would build arc upon arc, color upon color. And it gave them permission to try. And almost without exception, they were wonderful paintings when they finished. I didn't use any of their work here for ethical reasons, but the concept is the same. I like working with people that say they've never been an artist, they've never drawn. And I find that working with that point of view also gives them permission to just be what they do, right? They, be, they are what they do. They stop judging to some degree. And the piece on the right is simply from an iPhone. It's a Mandela program. And the reason I put this here, again, it takes no skill. It's an interactive piece. If we have the next slide, Claire. And if you click on that, I don't have any cool music, so I'll just talk. And if you see what's happening, it's simply a one finger exercise and there are certain controls where you pick the brushes you pick the colors but it only takes one finger to do this and the whole thing is an exploration and then it saves it and it saves it in this animated form so the client at that point makes something that they can show other people they can carry with them on a phone and the Kaleido free emblem on the right hand side of the screen is the name of the company that makes this free app. So this goes on for a while, but it's mesmerizing for me and I found it to be mesmerizing for clients who get caught up in the act of making rather than judging. And that's for me, that's, that's a gold mine. Can we have the next slide please? Next slide, please. So after, after graduating, one of the biggest topics was getting licensed in the field. So Claire, you wanna talk about licensure where you are? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, it's complicated, but necessary. So important to keep in mind. Um, so, <clears throat> Sorry, did I, sorry if I went too far here. So I live in Maryland um, and it is really awesome to um, have had really great support um, towards the process of licensure. Um, and in Maryland, you know, there is a kind of a state level um, 
license that I'm, I was able to apply for and um, take the board exam to be able to, that's one of the requirements for it, um, to be able to get that graduate license. And so I'm currently, you know, collecting hours, uh, supervision hours to be able to move towards the full licensure. Um, but the process itself, there's some like, uh, I know vocabulary here that we wanna talk through a little bit um, about the differences between the two. Jonathan, I don't know if you want to share anything first about your experience or if you wanna just sort of go move through this slide. Well, uh, kind of move through it, but I think it's important to say that Claire and I come from different states. I'm in Indiana yes. and the licensing procedure is similar, but very different because there's not a standalone license for art therapy in Indiana. So my degree, which is also from St. Mary of the Woods College in Indiana, uh, it was led by uh, Dr. Jill McNutt. And the first year I was there was the first year they got accreditation from KHEP. And that's an important thing to take note. What are the requirements of the state where you're gonna practice? Will your degree meet the requirements of that state? And the onus is on the student. You know, and it, it, you you, you kind of have to know what's in front of you and then fill, fill all of those buckets on your way to a license. But the licensing process is defined here, securing the authority to practice within the state. Got to have it. Sorry, Claire, I interrupted. No, it's okay. No, I think that was great. And that credential process. Um, is a little bit different in that you're really securing the, the education, the insurance, and the information that will meet the standards of practice required by um, the specific place that you work for. Um, so the ATRBC, um, and I think we have a slide with some of those acronyms there, um, uh, attainment remains a national standard. Um, it's, uh, and we'll talk kind of state by state here in a moment, um, but it's definitely critical that you, like Jonathan said, that you do that research to be able to understand like, where you're, um, where you are, where you're being, where you're getting your education, where you plan to work, and kind of think about those things as you're moving towards licensure. Um, there was a question here, should I be licensed in more than one state? Um, I know they're in some areas, like for example, where I am, the DMV, right, DC, Maryland, Virginia, um, many folks live and work in uh, one, two, or three of those states. Um, so those kind of questions are important, but like we said, with the, the state lines, despite being so close in proximity, um, still have different um, different processes and different uh, different like uh, there are different stages in terms of um, their licensing process and credentialing. Uh, it's also important to note here that the Art Therapy Credentials Board takes care of the Art Therapy Credentialing um, and the ATCB is separate from ADA. So I know that can be really confusing, um, but just important to kind of note that and um, develop your relationships uh, with both as you see fit. Um, and obviously ADA is the professional organization that we're presenting with tonight. May I, Shauna, ask me a question about the, uh, the dotted pieces that I did with the inpatient unit? Yeah, sure. Do you want me to go back to the slide? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, one, where time's running out, but the uh, she asked if I use rhythmic music while I do that. Yes, when I do use music, but it's uh, I I do that when I have an open studio. Here's music, and we have a request line where people choose what music we play, but they have to tell us why they chose it. That's the therapy part. So yes, Shauna, do you use music? Great question. And yes, we can save the questions for the end. So here's a little bit more about the state by state, um, kind of where we are at this time um, in terms of art therapy licensure. Um, and it's, this is important to note. I know that there are plenty of people, many, many people, um, and maybe some of you are, are uh, among those as well who are um, advocating for licensure um, in various states and working towards. Um, Indiana it. is doing that. It's a brown state. Yep. Do you want to talk about that, Jonathan? Are you? No, I don't think so. It's, no? okay. it's, it's, it's an ambition that the whole country would accept us as a bona fide license. Yeah. But I think we're a few years away from that. Absolutely. Um, it's definitely the dream. Um, 
and it's it's uh Jonathan I know I love that you mentioned earlier that you got hired as an art therapist and that's really important um, in Indiana yeah in, in Indiana, Indiana. Mm-hmm. I know that there are many folks who are <clears throat> who maybe come from um supervisors or communities where a lot of the um uh, kind of like the, the advice is to make yourself as like marketable as possible. And it's so important to recognize how to engage um, with others about with about art therapy um, and letting them, and sort of being an advocate too, and you being your own advocate for that. So the next slide maybe? Yeah, sure. This is all available on the ADA website, right? Okay. Next slide. This is for the ATCB, the Credentials Board. I just want to add, out of respect for our viewers' time, if you are interested, you can go to both of the websites, the uh, arttherapy.org website or the ATCB website, um, to look at more information about, specifically about licensing, licensure and credentialing. So just in case anybody's interested in that, you can go directly there. And I'll put that link in the chat too. Thank you very much. So in terms of choosing a program, for instance, I found that the, the leadership and lineage and lineage is like uh, art therapy seems to come from one individual to another. It's almost an oral tradition, right? Where we learn from someone, we become a devotee of their, uh, of their way of working. And then they become our mentors, our supervisors. And what I experienced in my program was a major change in leadership about halfway through. So that was just something to consider. Things change. And yeah. the stability of the program means a lot. And, and also applying for licensure in my state was actually painful. It took more than three months from application to um, licensure. I don't know what every other person's experience was, but it's not, it, it, my, my path was not direct or easy. And I know that we do want to make sure we have time for question and answer and for folks to be able to share, um, really engage in conversation. So, um, uh, you know, I had a different experience than Jonathan did and had some really good support, but certainly that, that onus, as we talked about, um, it, through this process, which can be really challenging and stressful, um, building community around that and communicating around it is super important. Um, I'm gonna move to the next slide. Takeaways, we can open it up for answering question. Really wanna encourage and celebrate all of those who are kind of in the process of moving into licensure or the journey into practice. Um, celebrate yourself, be your own best advocate. Uh, we're all gonna have unique experiences in this way, but that's why it's so important for opportunities like this for us to talk um, and to, you know, get to get a chance to really connect on what the experiences are like. So. Should we open it up? I think so. Uh, yeah, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you, everybody. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire and Jonathan. All of your hard work and all of your wonderful art and lived experiences here are just so phenomenal. And I hope everybody else is as inspired as I am. And future people will be watching this to be as inspired as we are. Um, so yay, clap. <laughs> um, listening someone, to you. Some, someone is asking if mod, the modeling and collaboration on spiral drawings, uh, especially the matrix, was done with one person or more than one person. Mm -hmm. So I've, I work one-on-one -on -one with people. I've never tried that in a group situation. It would be fascinating to try, but no, I did not. I haven't done that yet. Thanks for the idea, Susan. Yeah. Jonathan, we have another question too about modeling behavior. Uh, someone asked, can you elaborate more on what you mean by modeling behavior? Did you model how to use the tools or were you modeling the process of making art? In an open studio, I've been taught to let everybody work in whatever medium they choose and what, on whatever they choose. So I don't hinder that. I don't hover over that. I simply start working on something. And it's with intent, right? I, the intention is everything in therapy, I think. It was my intent not to work in a way that they're working, 
to show something new and different. And then I would just sit there and make the dots, right? Or sit there and make that spiral drawing. And I wait till I have buy-in, which means I, I, I watch them noticing me. And if a, if a session is an hour and a half, which is such a luxury these days, eventually they will ask what I'm doing. It almost never fails. And then I will demonstrate again and then encourage them to try, right? So that's what I mean by modeling. It's, I don't put myself in their face. I, I work with them and then they can ask me to keep it a collaboration, not a teaching experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. For sure. You're getting some good questions here. Yeah. Several questions coming in about license uh, licensure. So one person is asking, um, do you have any advice on how to choose a state to get licensed in? What are the panelists' thoughts on that? I would say that it's a it's an important um, decision to think about sort of your life and in the context that you know you're you are in in the moment. I mean, there's a lot of decisions in terms of. Uh, where you're going to be working, where you're going to be living. Um, uh, many of those things don't have to do necessarily with, with work, right? Like it could be about community or relationships or family or preference or whatever the case may be. Um, and then I think, I mean, for me, knowing that I wanted to be in a particular area because of those other things help inform me about, you know, then looking up information to get licensed in that place, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it sounds like kind of selecting a space that fits you personally and professionally. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to, you know, like I saw another question about this too. Like it's so hard to get an art therapy license. I saw that and I, I don't, I've made the mistake in the past of being like, oh, it's not, it's not hard. And that's not necessarily true. I lived in a place and, and had a lot of network that made it easier for me and it was still challenging. So I know that we're, many of us are still, um, kind of in this fight, right, to be able to be recognized and to have our license um, and our work uh, in this field recognized. And so that's important to consider. Um, my my, yeah, my ahead, entering the field for me was after I was here to take care of my parents mm. who were aging and they have now passed. But how does one spend their time in Indiana? So I found this program and decided to join the program. If I were looking for a program specifically, and was able to move. I'm not sure that I would have done this program, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be the absolutely right program for me because I met people who are now my supervisor. How do you find a supervisor? Someone's asking and, and um, it's finding someone who's doing what you wanna do, who thinks like you wanna think and then ask them, you know, you ask them. Yeah, yeah, I had a, oh, sorry, Jonathan. From no, no, you go ahead. I tend to I, ramble. Yeah, no, I was going to say that there was a, uh, I know there was a professor that I had who I didn't know about their supervisor kind of experiences or, or the way they were working in terms of taking supervi supervisees outside of school. Um, but they were working in a place that I really wanted to work. And so it was a matter of just having that conversation and saying, I'm curious about this. This is my experience. Like, can we talk more? Um, and, you know, we've developed a great relationship and they're still my supervisor now. They were, you know, in school and, and still are, which is incredible. So it's hard. It's hard to put yourself out there. But I think, Jonathan, you make a good point, like connecting with folks who are kind of on that same wavelength and are doing things that you're interested in doing. Um, it doesn't hurt to, like, reach out, use Google, Hannah, you know, like Hannah, find a locator. <laughs> Hannah, Sal Hannah Salman has asked if there was any red flags to look at when looking for it red flags to look for when applying for an art therapy job. And I would say one of the biggest ones is to get hired as an art therapist, if at all possible. So it's, I, my supervisor spent nine years as an activities director, right? That was the formal title, but they were an art therapist from top to bottom, right? It was about the services rendered, but in our day and age, I would recommend you look for a slot that appreciates what you're able to do with a client that other therapists may be able to do, but not in the way that you will do it. So mm -hmm. that to me would be a red flag to look for. A job's a job though, you know, when it's time to work, you wanna work. 
Something I'll also throw in the mix in response to supervision and job hunting is how important it is to kind of connect with your local or regional chapter as well as ADA as a resource. Um, you know, being part of your local chapter means you're in the mix with uh, practicing and often seasoned art therapists who may or may not be supervisors, as well as it's a space that can vet jobs in different settings for you. So I think as students being particip you know, participating in your local or regional chapters, as well as ADA, attending the conferences as a student is a great way to begin building that network so that by the time you graduate, you have the connections that you need and the support um, behind you to kind of go through these processes of credentialing and job hunting, which can you know, be difficult depending on where you decide you want to live and practice. Molly Cox is asking an interesting question. Are there any specific patient populations that would not be appropriate for art therapy interventions? Good question. I'm, you know, becoming an art therapist, right? Or entering the practice. I take that question and the first thing that comes to mind is as an art therapist, it's my job to be creative enough to find the right intervention for whatever population I'm faced with. And I didn't really think at the beginning of my degree, I'd be working with a prison population, right? So now, I mean, we're creative. That's why we do what we do. And it's almost our responsibility to come up with something creative for whatever population we're faced with. Can anyone in the panel think of any population that would not be appropriate for art therapy? Are we so inured to art therapy that we can't even imagine a population that wouldn't benefit? Right. Yeah. I think many of us believe, you know, art is universal and there is a way to bring people into creative process. But of course, as a practicing art therapist, it is important to kind of see and, you know, assess the appropriateness for art therapy for any given individual or population. Um, right. But I do agree, Jonathan, there are ways to kind of bridge that gap and find a way to bring arts or creativity into a variety of different spaces. And if you look at it right, that's the fun part is coming up with, oh, Oh, I can use this. I can use that. That's important. I will say there were there were a couple of questions about like being hired as a as not like not as an art therapist as a counselor or like in other roles and how do you bring your art therapy practice or your art therapist identity kind of to the forefront in the work you're doing? Um, and it that sort of had me thinking based on what we were just saying. Um, that I, I know for myself, you know, working in a non-public school setting, hired as an art therapist, folks there for the most part kind of know um, what it is that I do and what I'm doing when working with students. However, I also work in a private practice part-time and do that mostly virtually. So I'm not in, an, in a kind of an art space. I'm not in an art therapy space. I'm on the computer like this. Um, and so bringing, I think that into this realm, um, it's also a practice that has plenty of, of uh, LCPCs, plenty of therapists, right? And so folks don't always even know that they're gonna be working with someone who is, um, who identifies as an art therapist, right? Who is like going out in the world and saying that. So I, it is challenging. I think it can be, it can be tough, um, but certainly uh, like Tiana said too, just really kind of um, leading your client where they're at, recognizing um, how we can make art uh, a part of, integrated into our sessions. How can we make it part of, what we're doing, um, where, what is art, right? Being able to kind of have the, the, the client identify that for themselves. I mean, I have folks who talking about clothing and design and kind of the way that they, you know, aesthetically set something up. That's, that's where we find our creativity and art. Um, and it's, it's therapeutic. So it may not always look like what you expect. That's the fun part. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with some clients, I don't even use the word art because that scares the bejesus out of them. Yeah. Like those spiral drawings you saw. Right. It's like, no, it's whatever you want. Let's just call it cool. Now, the point that I would like to make, Claire, we talked about it before. There was a presentation at the ADA level about a shift in accreditation. And now that I have graduated from a KHEP program, I'm fine, right? I've gone through the licensing process. But for people who are following me, I think. Ashru, try to correct me if I'm wrong, but by 2024, there may be a shift to k CREP. k CREP only, yes, or that's the going to be the next standard, yes. And for those in education right now, that's an important note to follow. 
Yeah. Because again, the onus is on us to be our own best advocate. I also want to go back to some earlier questions um, about getting a counseling license and also thinking about, um, uh, there was a question about, what is it? Counseling across states and these different, you know, things are going to an effect kind of about um, jurisdiction. If you live somewhere, can you, can that be applied to another state if you travel there, move there? So any thoughts about, you know, you all and your credentialing or licensure, strictly art therapy, do you see value in the counseling depending on state? It's a challenging question. I think that a lot of folks have pretty uh, strong opinions about it, maybe one way or the other, maybe they don't. Um, but um, so I, I did, uh, and I'm in the process of obtaining dual licensure. So going for both the, the counseling license and the art therapy license. Um, again, I will say it's kind of a privilege to be able to do that. I know that's not everybody's um, case. And, and like, that was honestly, I did it because of direction from professors and supervisors. That was kind of the, I felt like a popular thing. That's like kind of what was recommended to me. Um, thinking about it kind of when I was within the process and even now, I, I do wonder and, and invite, you know, others to talk about um, what it means for us as our therapists um, to have to, or to feel like we have to rely on another license to be able to get work. Um, and so what that means for, you know, our therapy as a field and, and that identity and how do we, how do we move towards um, being able to really stand on the fact that our parity practice, what we learn, what we can do, what, um, our strengths, uh, we, we really are able to um, be in these clinical spaces and and be really powerful um, voices and, and practitioners. And I, we can do that with an art therapy license. So I don't know, it's, it's a really good question and an important discussion to keep having. May I put a plug in here? Sure. Um, for people who are asking about supervision and, and for me thinking about lineage and it's about people meeting people and knowing people in our field, which is a luxury, right? So many fields become cold and over-professionalized. We are not, we're lucky. And this conference coming up in Minneapolis, the ADA conference will be the first conference in person that I will ever attend. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for things like supervision, if you wanna meet the people that wrote your books, right? If you want to uh, schmooze, I mean, I'm really excited and a little intimidated, but not much. I'm too old to be shy. So I'm looking forward to the conference to make this more human rather than virtual. Because most of my degree has been virtual. I totally fine. appreciate it's, that. It's fine. But <laughs> give me the skin. I want people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is going to be virtual and in person this year. So yay. Um, I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. I do know it's like 505 at this moment. Thank you so much, everybody for like, you know, just your energy and having all these questions and comments and um, just sharing everything. It's so lovely. Um, I just want to add at the end. Um, to wrap up, this is only the third presentation in a four part series. After that, we will be creating more webinars and things that are more for members, um, but everybody is welcome to view the journey series, both here and on YouTube, um, once we look a little bit. The final part will discuss advancing art therapy on July 13th at the same time, 7 p.m. for East Coasters on the US, 4 p.m. for the West. Um, and we hope that you'll be there with us to catch other future ADA events and information and lived experiences all about art therapy.